became interested in gerontology? It was actually <clears throat> a fluke that uh, I became interested in gerontology. I was working at Brandeis University in the Heller School for Social Welfare and a project I'd been working on ended and my uh, in advisor, Howard Freeman, said, Carol, uh, the only funding we have is for you to write a proposal about housing for the elderly and the effects of different housing arrangements. And uh, I want you to go to the library and learn everything you can about gerontology. And um, at Brandeis, the library was open on Sundays, and I spent many weekends in the library. Uh, and I wrote a proposal with Howard Freeman to, <clears throat> to study the effects of different housing arrangements. Uh, and it basically was in 1964, and it was a time when um, there was a lot of money available in Washington, D.C. for applied research. And he was working with a forerunner of HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, and they wanted to know about Section 8. It didn't exist then, but it was on the drawing boards. And when you began that research, was there a lot to find to help write that proposal? Or just scant pieces of well, there, there were already some incredible women uh, involved, and most notable in my life and career and mentorship academically there was Bernice Newgarten, who was at the University of Chicago at the time. And I immediately came across her name and uh, followed her work in adult development, human development. So you, you already started a little bit talking about your career trajectory and being at Brandeis and having this opportunity to write the proposal, but maybe you can describe that a little bit more and um, specifically developing an identity as a gerontologist. I had, when I came to Brandeis, um, I was just finished with my master's degree at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And before that, I had been graduated from Stanford, and I'd been at UC University of California, Berkeley for a semester. And due to personal reasons, I moved to Dallas, got my master's, and I was very committed to the theoretical paradigms of the day, which were structural functionalism, uh, and uh, knew about symbolic interactionism and knew about qualitative and quantitative research. All of that was bedrock to my ability to um, write the proposal that I developed. And that proposal development um, was informative in that there were theories of human development and aging that I added to are the life course theories, which were Bernice Newgarden's, and of course uh, Elaine Cummings <coughs> and Bill Henry had disengagement theory. Those were the theories that were the rage at the time. And um, it was an important opportunity to bring my theoretical tool Kit, which I had, which was strong. I'd been at major universities, and the opportunity to work with Herbert Bloomer in Symbolic Interaction, who was George Herbert Mead's student, was formative. And <clears throat> I uh, read the literature, and there was very little in the literature about applied uh, aging beyond. There, Everything was around disengagement and how the elderly unilaterally and society were disengaging from each other. And um, with symbolic interaction, I was very interested in agency and the fact that it wasn't all, I didn't believe it was a unilateral uh, disengagement process. I, it, it was problematic for me, the old sociological term problematizing. 
and my strong theoretical base enable me to um, put this into a research proposal where we were looking at the differences between age isolated communities like Sun City, there were a few of them, uh, age integrated communities which were uh, living, aging in place I suppose in regular communities and uh, age uh, integrated which could be living in housing projects for the elderly or uh, congregate housing for the elderly. There wasn't all that much of that. but And so I got very much interested in space uh, and uh, living arrangements and wrote this proposal where we were going to look at the effects of different housing environments. So I was already into environment person interaction before that had been coined as a thing. Uh, and I went to the big database uh, then, which was um, a federal database of who else had gotten research in aging, and I discovered a man named Powell Lawton. And <clears throat> it turned out, um, and I was eventually in that database with the principal investigators, because after all I was a master's student age 23 or 4, um, and we made an arrangement to meet at some common place uh, where we were both at a meeting. And we each thought the other had been a longtime gerontologist. And uh, we laughed about that all the way to, <laughs> to the end. But I had the Lawton morale scales, the early versions, and of course the uh, theoretical toolbox which I put in, which strengthened our proposal. And um, we did get a $500,000 proposal from a uh, federal aid housing agency, whatever that was then. And uh, we uh, hired Bernice Newgarten as a consultant and Powell Lawton as a, used some of his tools. And I was in deep by then. And Yankelovich, who is a big hotshot survey research firm in New York, um, went and worked out <coughs> contracts with him. It was amazing how much autonomy I really had. Uh, so I went from being a research assistant to the project director in a short period of time just because of how it rolled out. And um, so Bernice Newgarten and I went and gave papers and I, I was doing critiques of the theories very early that disengagement and structural functionalism um, was, well, although it was the, the dominant, most popular paradigm at the time, and it was uh, <clears throat> very solid in sociology. Because I'd had Herbert Bloomer and symbolic interaction, I had an alternative frame, and then Bernice Newgarten gave me another frame to look at these problems and what was happening to people. So there were lots of options for how people might respond. Our dependent variable was health and um, mental health, uh, health. We didn't have health outcomes research then, but uh, I think it was mostly probably self-reported health. And um, social health, social interaction, and social support, and the morale scale. Long answer. Excellent answer. Is it, it's funny that you say when you met Lawton, you both thought the other were long-time gerontologists, so you kind of quickly transitioned into that identity. Um, would you say that you easily embraced it, or did it take a while to really self-identify yourself? as a gerontologist? I definitely <coughs> was getting close to identity. Mm -hmm. But years later when I went back for my doctorate, uh, I was told that gerontology was not a legitimate field. It was not sociology. I could not have a specialty in that. I could not have an exam in that. <coughs> if I had to do it, I could make it my dissertation on that topic which is what I did. So um, there were two phases. The first phase was, um, I would say, immersion in um, the discourse, a trendy term now, but of 
gerontologist and um, with the gift of the theoretical lens that I could bring, which I think was unique, that I had been at these different universities where there, there was different value sets and theories that were the theory of the day for them. Mm -hmm. And um, the wonderful thing is that we develop papers from this project and the next thing I knew I was on a plane to Vienna for the International Congress of Gerontology and meeting Bernice Newgarten and we were going to Greece together. Uh, and that was incredible to have a sponsor, if it, as it were, uh, to have be doing obviously all my papers. I was either second author <coughs> or later down, even though I was writing them and doing them. Uh, but I had significant heavy duty um, intellectual work at the top in the principal investigators. We, you've already st mentioned several female mentors, but perhaps you can talk a bit more about Bernice, et cetera, who impacted this trajectory for you. Um, is there anything unique about that experience as a woman? It was very fortunate that I met her and was, um, I'd say, my socialization to the discipline was at the side of a woman. And <clears throat> since I had never and did never have a professor in my baccalaureate at Stanford, my master's at SMU, and my doctorate at the University of California, San Francisco, I never had a woman professor. I had one instructor at Stanford, never a woman professor. So I, this was the mentorship that uh, was very important, and she carried me into the Gerontological Society and opened all sorts of uh, doors just because I was at her arm. She was, I don't know if she was president then, but she was president sometime around that. And <clears throat> as a person who was oriented uh, to politics um, and political sociology, Myself, I failed to mention so far that my master's thesis was a study of the power structure of Dallas, Texas, and it was published as a book. And that was um, looking at C. Wright Mills' power elite and Floyd Hunter, who'd done the community power structure work, as opposed to Robert Dahl and the, um, the work on pluralist theory, which is everybody has a chance and it's all fine and, you know, we have the democracy that we have and the way things are because we want them as opposed to there's a power elite that is um, stocking the deck. Were there other women that through Bernice's um, shepherding that you then met and maybe you can speak about that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Well, I obviously um, met Ethel Shanus and uh, admired her very much, was introduced to the, to the fact of international cross-comparative stuff and how important um, that was, but how difficult because in the work I was doing at Brandeis, measurement and um, sampling, statistical sampling, we brought in Les Kish from the University of Michigan, who is the father of statistical uh, sampling. And these, these learnings or learning experiences um, were mainly men and mainly men mentors, but those were two uh, that I could speak to. The most important women mentors that I had in my life uh, came later in Maggie Kuhn and Tish Summers and of course my mother. Um, in many important respects. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that, those later mentors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Maggie, well, I'll start with my mom first. Mom um, was a wonder woman. She was uh, able to do everything. She was, uh, she had a master's in art and art history from Columbia University in 1928. Um, she had 
founded an art department in a college in Virginia. She uh, could do everything. And um, she met my dad and um, her, her intellectual life continued, but she was not permitted to work or it was not um, role appropriate. And uh, she did many things, mathematics, she was uh, a uh, writer, and the most important thing was she wrote murder mysteries that were, uh, two of them were in the Doubleday Crime Club. She was asked to become a regular, and she, w she was published in many languages, but my father was very angry about the more notoriety she got, the more he, he shut it down, and she willingly went. Um, with, with negative mental health consequences. But she always said to me when I was working on the beauty of my Southern Methodist University experience was I was living at home and uh, she was uh, helping me uh, with my thesis because I was doing the whole thing, the whole study and writing it in nine months. And I did and graduated in May, but I'd had a semester at Berkeley and very substantial work there. Um, so mom was my role model about, you can do it, honey. You can write, you can write. And for me it became, that was my voice. I, I couldn't have a voice in verbal speaking. I was very uh, closed down because mom had been closed down for being out, out as a person with her own uh, mission and calling. So I learned to be silent and uh, then I, when I finished my doctorate, I'm skipping around, Maggie came into my life because I had a graduate student who lived in Germantown, which is where Maggie had a house and she had been a Grey Panther in Philadelphia. And she took my policy class and said, you've got to meet Maggie, and Maggie's got to meet you. Well, Maggie then was on television. She was uh, very charismatic and well uh, positioned and known, and I was flabbergasted to have the opportunity to meet her. And we arranged, and I went and about two weeks later to Philadelphia and stayed at her house and met her, and we had a wonderful connection, and she was a very close-in mentor, how privileged, how incredible uh, to become part of the Great Panthers movement and to watch a woman who knew what she was fighting for and uh, knew how to make things happen. And she was using her voice and she would say, Carol, you've got to um, write and you've got to speak and you've got to do this work and um, this work being more active uh, as an intellectual and we need the scholarship, we need the critique because already I was writing critical uh, things, critiquing theories of aging for being either um, normative or individual, life course being too I wasn't throwing all the theories out the window, but I was very much more into agency uh, and that we could make a difference and we could construct realities and we could deconstruct realities and we could reconstruct realities, but not easily because after all I understood about the power elite and the control of, of uh, discourse and resources and how important that was. So she was, um, she picked right up on that writing and critique that I'd done of dominant and competing theories. I remember that was one of my early articles in gerontology. And um, when I wrote The Aging Enterprise, which was actually after my doctorate, she carried it around in her satchel everywhere and told people they needed to read that. And it was uh, a critique of um, the uh, 
enterprise where uh, the elderly didn't have agency. It was giving, making them dependent with services and making them altruistically uh, given. Uh, however, it wasn't giving agency to elders. They needed their own health care. They needed their own um, social security, adequate income, housing, all these things. So I was always um, from the beginning, and Maggie helped make that happen. But she made many connections for me. Everything's connected. She was a sociologist. She was trained uh, at, I forget, in Cleveland somewhere, and um, was very much moved by C. Wright Mills and the link of individual troubles to institutional issues and big problems. And so her bringing uh, youth and the elderly together, and we're all in this together, was very formative in what has become a major work for me. The other woman also I met through my class, my first class at, at University of California, San Francisco, after I had my doctorate, and it was Tish Summers. And I had her come to my class, my policy class, because, of course, she lived in Oakland and the, I was in San Francisco. And she um, said, Carol, um, I love your aging enterprise, but where are the women? And that was a wake-up call. Uh, feminist theory uh, I knew only through living through the, the first wave. Maybe it was the second wave. Maybe it was the first and the second <laughs> in, in uh, some of the women's politics because I was swept up in all those social movements and that was another gift of a historical moment intersecting with my um, time at Brandeis in Boston and the ferment and marching in the streets and I was out there too on race, class, gender, the war, all that. And it was just, um, so it taught me a lot more about power and structure and uh, surveillance uh, and police action and the state, how it, how it although it, it could be uh, welfare and, and it could be positive things like democracy, it could also be very, very dark and concerning. So uh, it was a natural for Tish to say, open that feminist door and uh, get back to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she was, uh, I'd say, uh, to call her a sidekick is, is not fair. She was so much her own person, but a brilliant role model who also was making a movement and knew what she wanted to do. And to see these two women who were both forceful in voice and in action and in motivating and empowering, uh, they were not reticent and silent like I had been taught to be and had come to be until I wrote The Aging Enterprise, was kind of my, my voice opens up. And um, so those two experiences were incredible, but with my mom saying, honey, you can do this, you can write. And that helped me publish the first book that I had, which was on the power structure of Dallas. That's what it was called, The Decision Makers, The Power Structure of Dallas. Of course, it were all men. There was not one decision maker in the 67 decision makers that were identified in the power elite, not one woman. That's Dallas. It was published in 1963, which was when Kennedy was killed in the assassination, and that was another whole episode of the socio-historical event, which was very formative for me. So what I, <clears throat> what I hear you say is your mother taught you to find that inner strength to power through, and then Maggie and Tish challenged you to then channel that into a strong voice, <clears throat> both for aging and for women. And for social justice. To see Maggie Kuhn sit there as this nice little old lady with white hair and her pink tennis shoes, and then start talking about global imperialism 
and um, social justice and peace uh, and capitalism. And uh, then the Grey Panthers were writing about attacks on Social Security, actually. I have some working papers, very interesting. How would you say then, um, as you age, being a gerontologist has um, intersected with that experience, that personal experience of aging? My personal experience of aging is, um, of course, very much shaped by the, um, the learning and the work that I have done. And I have been blessed by virtue of these earlier intersections with social movements and with scholars uh, and opportunities to be carried into different Worlds. So I always, as I'm faced with problems, not always, I'm a human being, but I, my analytic lens is what is the structural basis and origin of these problems? And how can I uh, address them and, or help in terms of social movements I've been working more recently on the resistance movement to the privatization of Social Security and uh, to the takedown of the welfare state, which is the project of the right political uh, side. And um, that has been very much informed by uh, the structural approach and that I have, but I've always got agency too. So this is an opportunity to resist, to move the dialogue, to set the stage for a better socio-historical time, and to be part of the socio-historical moment. So I'm very captivated by uh, being uh, involved and active and not giving in and giving up. Um, when I was uh, silent, completely silent, shut down. Uh, the whole concept of S S Seligman's learned helplessness was one that I encountered. And of course there's a whole line of research following from that in Laura Karstensen's wonderful work now uh, about the possibilities and the whole work on resilience and uh, aging and positive aging um, is very much inculcated into my thinking. So I have, uh, I'm working on my own active aging, but not ideologically committed to active aging as the solution because most people do not have the resources uh, to engage in active aging. They can't walk safely, they can't eat well, they're inundated by a material culture that is uh, not doing right by us, and now a politics, a global politics and a state politics that is very contentious and hard. So, as you know, this WIGO project is focusing on legacies of older women gerontologists. So within that framework, is there anything that you need to know? Well, I think legacy is so much more than what happens in gerontology. And that, that is Maggie's innovation and genius insight was that it's not just aging. It's youth and aging. It's infant and aging. It is everything and that hopefully through the work in gerontology. It's, it's not an enclosure, it's an opening to the world. Uh, and to work toward the larger issues and questions. So the linking of social movements, the linking of ideational and uh, theoretical work across the disciplines is all very much um, what 
the future and the best is going to happen. And for me, in my own scholarly work, bringing together uh, the symbolic interactionist and interpretive work, uh, the work on discourse and so forth, but with the larger structures and the recognition of the, of the uh, contest, the conflict, and the enormous consequences and the difficulty of agency carrying forward to move structures that get institutionalized, instantiated, taken for granted, and hegemonic. Um, so I think the lesson, the big thing for legacy is that we can inform the world how it works what are the processes by which it works, but we also have an obligation to be working toward um, social change where there is um, no or little justice. And the whole cumulative advantage, uh, disadvantage theories, and even more recently I've been privileged to be brought in to issues about telomeres and um, the, the fact that the length of telomeres, so this is the cells to society. So here's, here's gerontology, but you know, blasting out beyond confined borders of age and even the problematization about age. But certainly the fact that telomeres, uh, who are these caps on, who are, what are <laughs> these caps on the ends of, of uh, some DNA strands, the telomeres get short, shortened with stress, and, and the telomeres may be lengthened, some experimental work, uh, by dealing with issues of stress. And Elizabeth Blackburn, who's the Nobel Prize winner, one of them, uh, who discovered telomeres and telomerase, uh, with her uh, graduate student, has uh, found that low education and, and even having been abused as a mother and a baby in utero can have shortened telomeres, base, shorter telomeres than babies of mothers who have not been stressed similar. So they've um, really opened the world and want to work with us. So it, that is a whole new opening too. Um, I've been uh, very concerned, and we all are, about the ethics of genes and genetics and a lot of things going on there, but it's opening the world. That's the legacy, is, is making the world a better place.